You know, typically I find myself every few weeks here uh, introducing uh, an event or a speaker, and uh, again, always I have I find myself uh, mentioning some disaster, uh, some crime, uh, uh, some calamity that impacts the very lands, territories that uh, we are exploring, discussing uh, from a historical perspective. And uh, my, I was thinking that uh, the calamity that I was going to be mentioning today, uh, at least this was the case a couple of weeks ago, was the ongoing blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, that has been going on for two months now. And of course, uh, the, in addition to that, uh, you know, over the past week, uh, the, the horrible earthquake took place in, uh, in, in Turkey and Syria with the devastation and loss that it has, it has caused uh, in uh, the very lands, sometimes specifically the very areas that we're going to be uh, addressing and discussing today. Uh, not only that, but uh, one of our speakers actually calls Aintab uh, home, and uh, he will be the first uh, to, to speak today. But first I'd like to uh, thank everyone who helped make this event possible. Uh, beginning with uh, my department, the East and South Asian African Studies, uh, with uh, Kevo Kavadisian, Chair of Armenian History and Civilization, Alison Baka, uh, with the Armenian Center and the uh, National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, lineup of speakers today who will address uh, Armenians, Kurds, and the early Republican Turkey from a number of perspectives that I think put together will offer a sort of a holistic big picture uh, of, uh, you know, uh, major transformations that were taking place uh, around 100 years ago and the way in which Armenians Kurds and the Republic of Turkey shaped and were shaped by these transformations. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to start with introducing uh, Umut Kurt, who he just reminded me this is his fourth time speaking here. So I do think there's some privileged uh, <laughs> uh, position he is in. Uh, uh, Imit, uh, Imit's uh, talk is, is titled Modern Bandits in Transition from Late Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic, the story of property transfer in Aintab from warlords to urban Republican elite. Uh, Imit is a historian of the modern Middle East. His research is on social, cultural, and economic history of the late Ottoman Empire and the Turkish Republic in the 19th and 20th centuries with a special focus on the Armenian genocide and dispossession of Ottoman Armenians at large, imperial interests, ethnic politics, forced migration, and infrastructural transformations. Uh, his recent book, The Armenians of Aintab, has been a recipient of the Dr. Sona Aonian Book Prize for Excellence in Armenian Studies, honorable mention book prize by Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, so, I have still 15 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, on 28th of July, 1915, a decision was taken temporarily uh, to expel Armenians from mind. Accordingly, it was announced that those who wanted to sell their movable property could do so, and those who had to leave their homes could hand over the keys to the head headman. These announcements were posted on the walls in the Armenian neighborhoods of Ainta by the city crowd. Convinced that the deportation process was temporary, Armenians did not take most of their belongings with them or chose not to sell them. Many of them locked the doors of their homes and gave the keys to neighbors they knew or kept, them, kept those keys with them. It was stated that they could return to their homes after a temporary period of time and the government would preserve the property and other belongings of Armenians. However, events, events took a different turn. On August 1st, 1915, just before they were sent to Aleppo from Akchako in the train station, they had to sell their belongings and mobile goods at very low prices. Alice Kasazian, who managed to bribe her way to Aleppo under the protection of the Kurdish guards accompanying them, recounts that before they left Aintab, they tried to sell their belongings by unfolding a rock in the middle of the neighborhood while their Muslim neighbors swarm around them. When Alice Kazasian and her Armenian neighbors were taken to the deportation road, 
The same people would stand in the windows of their houses, sing, it yola bindi, it yola bindi, it yola bindi. The dog is on, our, on its way, the dog is on its way, the dog is on its way. While clapping their hands together. Wahai Gülesaryan, another native of Ainta, who survived the genocide, recalls those days and mentions that the neighborhood they lived turned into a place of looting. For Tay, Turkish, Kurdish and Arab neighbors, this looting was an opportunity of a lifetime. Civilians, ordinary Muslims, began to flock to the houses empty of Armenians, their neighbors. Armenians who were notified they would be deported tried to sell whatever they could before they were forcibly removed from the city as they would need money for, dif for the difficult deportation road. However, these items were either looted or sold at ridiculous prices, far from their real value. Historian Richard Slatt defines banditry and shakafet as the seizure of the property of others, often by a group of men, using force or coercion. The process which began in Aintab in 1915, August 1915, with the deportation of Gregorian Armenians in the first place, and continued with the deportation of Catholic and Protestant Armenians in November and December 1915, was put into practice by the so-called Ayan local elites, Turkish, Kurdish and Arab civilian Muslims, military and civilian bureaucratic elites, the notables of Ainta, who were actually the warlords. In this process, in addition to political and physical acts of, acts of collective violence, the motivation that brought these people from different segments of society together was to loot the movables and goods that the deported Armenians had to leave behind and so-called buy them by paying symbolic prices well below their market value and to transfer the immovable properties into their own hands, so to speak, to seize, to appropriate wealth and riches created by them. Such an economic motivation play a visible role in the development and the growth of the mechanisms of consent and support for the deportation and extermination of Armenians. In this respect, and in, in accordance with the Richard Slatter's definition, local notables and ordinary people of Ainta benefited from the economy of extortion and banditry found a space for articulation through massive plunder. For instance, Ali Jenani, an Ainta deputy, and Ahmed Faik Bey, the district governor of the town back then, they took an active role both in the total deportation of Armenians of the city in, and in the mobilization of local elements in the region, inclusion of a large part of society in this process. They were also at the forefront of the process of confiscating and plundering the wealth, possessions, and Armenians of Aintab had to leave behind after their deportation. Ahmed Faik Bey, in particular, involved local actors in this process with the guarantee that the property and assets left behind by other Armenians would be theirs. In order to confiscate and liquidate the properties of nearly 15,000 Armenians, an executive committee was even formed. Representing this committee, Debbal Kimyazade, Nurbey Oğlu Kadir and Hacı Halilzade Zeki, the prominent men of the city, local lords, traveled to Derzor. These warlords wanted to make sure with their own eyes that the real conditions of the Armenians of Ainta, whose property they wanted to seize, would make it impossible for them to return to Ainta and survive. After returning from Derzor, they accelerated the liquidation process. Deportations, on the one hand, and the looting and the pillaging inside in the city, on, on the other hand, continue rapidly. Harutu Nazaryan, who was 18 years old at the time of deportation, described how the Kayajik neighborhood, where the Armenians of Aintab were, were most densely populated, turned into a marketplace from the beginning of August 1915. The belongings of Armenians were taken out of their homes and sold for the next to nothing in the bazaars set up in the middle of the streets. Even the stones of the houses were removed. It's not the owners who determine the prices, but those who so-called buy them. In his memoirs, Yervan Küçükyan, who survived the deportations and the genocide, vividly describes how neighbors and the Kurdish villages from the surrounding villages swarmed over the belongings in his family's house and how they were forced to dispose of them at one-fifth the price. One of the most important reasons why Armenian deportees broke down from poverty and hunger on the deportation roads 
besides the sheer violence and in the camps was that their valuables were taken away from them in this way. They do not even have enough money in their pockets to buy food or to bribe the officers or soldiers accompanying them on the deportation road to protect them on the roads or even give them water. Efronia Khachadurian from Ayinta, who was exempted from deportation, witnessed the looting of the belongings laid out on the rocks in the middle of the street. He, she depicted the process as follows. Armenians brought everything they could sell to the markets in the streets. But who would want to buy them? The Turks knew very well, sooner or later, these things would belong to them. Two cries said, do not be afraid. Lock your doors, put your money in the bank, or hand it over to Turkish acquaintances. After a short time, you will return to your homes. The government guarantee, guarantees you this. Likewise, Kirkor Bavaryan, who was deported with his family to the town of Salamia in Syria, remembers those days in the same way. Quote, the neighborhoods and the districts where Armenians live literally turned into huge bazaars. Everything that could be sold was displayed on the streets. Items from homes of Armenians sent to Akchakoyunlu train station were sold for one twentieth of their value. These markets were set up in front of those Armenians' houses. On August 22, 1915, the doors of the largest church belonging to the Orthodox Armenians, Surp Asfazetsi Ngegegetsi, which contained some of the belongings taken from the homes of Armenians on their way to exile, were locked and sealed. The items were then auctioned and bought at prices for below their value by members of the Aintaf's local elite. Hagop Kabejian, who witnessed this process, records that the belongings and other valuables in the homes of Armenians were looted and plundered by Muslim Turks and Kurds. These belongings and assets were put up for sale by the looters in the bazaar set up in front of the looted Armenian homes. The Armenians of Aintaf were forced to abandon their possessions, homes and valuables, churches and schools, and the local notables, led by ordinary Muslims, were responsible for their miserable situation on the roads of deportation. This process appears another form of banditry. Who are these guys? Eyüp Sabri, the bookkeeper, Hakkı, the Evkaf officer, Tahçizade Abdullah, the second head of the Antep Union and Progress Society, Kahyazade Hüseyin Cemil Göğüş, Mennanzade Mustafa, Imamzade Mustafa, İncozade Hasan, and so on and so forth. I attend the high school of the, the most of the great granddaughters and sons of these families, by the way. In addition to these names, warlords such as Hafız Şahin Efendi, Kurdish Hacı Osman Ağa, and Mamat Azad Ali Efendi, who were the members of the Aintaf CUP club, and who led the deportation and the subsequent dispossession and plunder operation, founded a resistance organization against the British occupation in 1919 in the city, just before their arrest. For the people of Ainta, the real occupation began in November 1919 as a battalion of Armenian soldiers, La Jeune joined the French military forces that replaced the British occupation forces. As soon as Armenians set foot in the city, tensions between Armenians and Muslims began to escalate. For the people of Ainta, the occupation forces were now Armenians, not French or British. Moreover, the French occupation forces exaggerated the return of properties, which had been slowed down by the British. With the arrival of Armenians in the city, an organized group and local gentry who supported this group naturally realized that the properties and wealth they had acquired during the deportation would be lost in this way. For this reason, they decided to provide material and logistical support to the Nash Kemalist Nationalist Forces emerging in Anatolia and to organize and arm and organize resistance movement in the city. However, the notables in question had withheld their support to Nationalist Forces until that moment and even displayed an attitude of satisfaction with the British occupation. Therefore, the essence of war, as an epic heroism that gave Antep the title of Ghazi, was actually a struggle to make it impossible for Armenians to return to the city and to eliminate the Armenian presence in their hometown. Many of those who actively participated in the deportation and the genocide were members of the prominent local notables of the city. In addition to these people, other military and civilian bureaucrats of the city, finally the civilian population, were also involved as perpetrators in these actions. In other words, most of the perpetrators belong to the upper class, with the 
establishment of the republic, these individuals either maintained their position or rose even higher. For example, Ali Janani Bey, while taking part in all the process between 1915 and 1921, he became a deputy when the national struggle period begins and the Grand National Assembly was established. After the establishment of the Republic, he maintained his seat in the Assembly as someone very close to Mustafa Kemal and became the Minister of Commerce in 1924. He was also an exile from Malta. After the Armenians completely left the city in 1921-1922, the houses, fields, land and other real estate properties left by them were sold very small amounts. In other words, these properties were given to those who were useful in the struggle against the Armenians and the French in the city, to the district commanders and those who participated in the war. In fact, conflicts arose between some local elements who participated in the war, uh, fought, struggled and considered themselves truly from Ainta, and other notables who left the city the be at the beginning of the war did not, slowly, did not show any merit but came back after the Armenians and the French had evacuated the city and took possession of the properties left by them. There was an open property dispute. Nearly, it's possible to read the entire local history of Aintab between 1919 and 1921 through this conflict. One day after the war, a crier goes around the whole of Gaziantep saying that people who have been useful in the war should come to Tuzhan. Everyone went. My father was among them, of course. Queue up two by two. Two people will enter through this door. My father's turn comes. There are many keys on a big rock. They say each person should take two of the keys. There is also a medal. My father looks at it. So we save Ainta for these two keys and that piece of thing. Thank you. And he walks out. Those keys were the keys of Armenians and two keys mean two houses. Selçuk Beşe quotes these sentences from his father Ali Beşe, who was one of the founding fathers of Aintab CUP club and a prominent, prominent figure in the city, a veteran of the Battle of Antep, Antep Salunmas. The same Ali Beşe, one of Mustafa Kemal's trusted figures, was assigned to train entrepreneurs for Gaziantep, one of the most prominent cities of the newly established Republican regime. Ali Beşe, who was also a close friend of Kılıç Ali, selected five young people from the city to study engineering in Germany in line with Mustafa Kemal's instructions. One of these young, uh, young, young Jamil Alevli, one of the biggest entrepreneurs and industrialists of Gaziantep in the 60s and 70s. Of course, in order to become an entrepreneur, it's not only to study in Germany, in order to meet Jamil Alevli's need for capital, the Armenian property belonging to Kalutsyan family came to his rescue. In 1932, a house belonging to Kalutsyan, together with the buildings of Atenagan, an Armenian school, and the second Catholic church were given to Jamila Levli for an extremely low amount of money. <laughs> Dr. Holmes is the first person to have conducted a field survey of the Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF, between 2015 and 2021, allowing her to analyze the transformations of the Turkish-Kurdish conflict over time. Her third book is forthcoming with Oxford University Press in 2023, Statement of Survivors, The Making of a Semi-Autonomous Region in Northeast Syria. Please welcome in. So, and, and the, the title for my presentation actually comes from a poem um, where it's, it's a poem about one of the military commanders in this uh, rebellion, um, Farzanda Bey, uh, where the poem is, it's a long poem, um, about seven minutes long, I think, in, when, it's, when it's spoken, and one line of the poem is, since the old days we have been the fugitives of the Turk, the escapees of the state. And so the escapees of the state comes from, from this poem about one of the leaders of this rebellion. So why did I start to write and get interested in this, in this uh, Mount Adra rebellion? It's because when I was doing my survey of the Syrian Democratic Forces um, in Northeast Syria that Hachik mentioned, um, I, I thought when I started this project in 2015 that I would be doing a survey of primarily Kurdish uh, fighters in what was at that point still the YPG or YPJ um, 
which then evolved in the fall of 2015 into the Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, over the course of conducting this survey, which I did over the course of um, a number of years, between 2015 and 2017, going back uh, basically every year, uh, sometimes multiple times in one year, um, and I would, you know, basically every time another <coughs> part of northeast Syria would be liberated from Daesh, from the Islamic State, I would be able to conduct the survey in that region. So in Akka, Mandij, Taqqa, Derazor, etc., as those cities became liberated from the Islamic State. And I discovered then that there were actually also, of course, Arabs that were in the SDF, but also uh, members of the Christian minority. So Assyrians, Syriac Christians, as well as Armenians. And they hadn't been written about very much in the, in the media. They're organized in different military units, which I won't go into now in detail because that's not what I'm here to talk about. But these are um, young men that are in the Syriac military council. Um, that photo was taken in 2019 in a village that's very near the Turkish border. Um, and as I was conducting the survey with them and uh, talking to them and interviewing them, they described themselves to me as descendants of survivors. And this is what got me interested in looking into what exactly did they mean by that, to be a descendant of a survivor. They were not referring to surviving the atrocities committed by the Islamic State, which were horrific. Um, they were not referring to the atrocities committed by the Assad regime, which are also horrific. They were referring to, of course, the atrocities committed at the time of 1915 of the Armenian-Assyrian uh, genocide, and that they are the descendants of those who survived uh, the deportations. So this is why I began to look into this, um, this history. And as I read um, books and um, articles and began to, to learn more about the, the, the Armenian genocide, I also came across, of course, the history of the various rebellions that took place after the genocide. Um, and of those, Sheikh Saeed, the Darcy Revolt, Bitlis, etc., I found this Adalat rebellion to be the most interesting and the most, to me at least, fascinating, and yet also the most understudied. Mm -hmm. And I don't exactly have an explanation for why that is, Perhaps it's because those who pose it have done the most to erase its memory. I don't know. Uh, I welcome your feedback on that. So in my um, book that's coming out this summer, um, I have one chapter about the Arab Rebellion. The rest of the book is about the situation um, as the conflict evolved since 2011 and the creation of the semi-autonomous region in northeast Syria. Um, I'd be happy to talk about it more in the Q&A if you like, but for now I'll just focus on this um, uh, Adalat uh, rebellion. And I've kind of decided to structure my, my presentation in a little bit of an unusual way that I haven't done before. Um, so essentially, because we don't have a lot of time and it's quite a complicated um, history, um, I'm going to be talking about 10 things we know about the Republic of Mount Adalat. Now, there's many things we don't know. There's probably, you know, a hundred things, a thousand things we do not know about this rebellion. It's still really, I think, quite, um, quite understudied. And I hope that this presentation will encourage and, you know, people to, to look into this more. Um, so, first of all, the Republic of Mount Ararat declared its independence from the, the Turkish Republic on October 8, 1927. So this wasn't just a rebellion or an uprising like the Sheikh Zayed Rebellion, for example, in 1925, that they actually claimed to be creating an independent um, statelet. Um, the territory where this statelet existed was um, around, of course, the province of Ada, the Ararat region on the border to Armenia. If you can see on this map, it's this section here. So it goes all the way up to Erzurum and down uh, to Lake Van. And this map is from the memoirs of Issa Muri, one of the leaders of the Adarash Rebellion. So number two, the Republic of Mount Adarat came into existence because of cooperation between Kurds and Armenians. Um, it was based on an official treaty of cooperation between the Kurdish Khoibu League and the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the Dashnaks, in which they agreed to collaborate for the liberation of Armenians and Kurds. Uh, this is a photo of Ardashev's Moradian. I've been told no relation to Khachik. <laughs> um, he was known by the nom de Gour, uh, Zilan Bey. 
and um, Issa Nouri, the Kurdish commander in chief of the forces on uh, Mount Ararat. Number three, one of the preconditions of support that the ARF provided the Armenian Revolutionary Federation to Khoibun was that there uh, be Kurdish unity. And so they actually had to take an oath, what they call the Khoibun Oath. I do hereby swear on my honor and religion that from the date of my signing of this undertaking to a period of two years, I do not use arms against any Kurd unless an attack is made on my life and honor. I do postpone the expiry of these two years, all blood feuds, etc. So they had to actually swear this oath that they would you know, unify the various Kurdish um, tribes and organizations, and actually the other Kurdish organizations were dissolved so that they would be unified under this um, hoizu. Number four, Mount Ararat had many of the trappings of a de facto statehood. They had their own flag, they wrote a national anthem, they wrote their own laws, they demanded that all Turkish soldiers leave the area, and they created a civilian administration. Now, we, don't, we do not know the extent to which this administration actually existed, but they did appoint a leader of the administration, and they had, as I said, many of the trappings, at least, of what looked like a state, a statelet. Um, but I think, personally, more interesting than this question is the fact that they, um, first of all, worked to overcome uh, grievances and mistrust between Kurds and Armenians. <coughs> Um, in the aftermath of the genocide, when some Kurds were implicated in, in the genocide and the deportations, um, but that the ideology that they developed, um, according to their at least 12-point proclamation, if you can call it an ideology, at least some ideas that they have uh, sketched out, is that uh, it's egalitarian. Um, so, point seven it clearly stated that all inhabitants, regardless of race or religion, will be treated equally. Number nine, despite this um, quite uh, severe violence, um, the rebels did not give up easily. The unpublished, uh, these are unpublished minutes of another meeting um, in 1931. Um, although Turkish officials claimed they had defeated the uprising in 1930, but still, um, a year and a half later, they were still planning, um, according to these documents, to not only continue the rebellion, but to actually expand it. So you see, um, they're talking about la uh, organisation du pays to organize the basis of the insurrection and the resistance in all of these districts: Ararat, um, Erzurum, Hakkari, Botan, meaning Jazira, Siirt, Midyat, Sasun, um, etc. So they were actually planning to even expand it. I mean, they they didn't um, they didn't give up easily, despite the the you know reportedly huge, huge massacres that occurred um, in the area. And finally, Turkish officials believed after they did crush the rebellion that they had not only defeated Mount Ararat, but resolved the entire Kurdish question. Um, this is a, the Turkish foreign minister allegedly said that the Kurdish question had become part of history, and this is a cartoon from uh, Miliet in 1930 um, with the inscription um, of Ara, so Ararat, and that imagined Kurdistan is buried here. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Fasadur Stefanian. Uh, his presentation is titled The Relations Between the Republic of Turkey and Soviet Armenia in the 1920s. Uh, Dr. Fatshadu Stepan is the head of, uh, of the Chair of World History and its Teaching Methods at the Fatshadu Apogian Armenian State Pedagogical University. His research interests include the, problem, the problems of the history of the national liberation struggle of the Armenian people in the late 19th century and early 20th century, of the, Republic of, the history of the Republic of Armenia 1918-1920, of Armenian-Georgian relations, of the Armenian social political thought in diaspora in the 20s and 30s, of Soviet Armenia and Transcaucasia. After which, if necessary, I will detail it with questions and answers. The relations between the Republic of Turkey and Soviet Armenia uh, in 1920s were determined by several factors. First of all, it should be noted that Soviet Armenia could not have absolutely independent relations with Turkey without 
Moscow's tradition. An important factor in the armenian turkish relations was the issue of the border, which was fixed by the Moscow Agreement of March 16, 1921, and Kars Agreement of October 13, 1921. On March 16, 1921, the Russian-Turkish Friendship and Brotherhood Agreement was signed in Moscow. The treaty determined the northeastern border of Turkey, which would pass through the Akhurian and Arax River in the neighboring of Armenia. The Kars region was ceded to Turkey, as well as Surmalu province, which was never part of Turkey. In place of Surmalu, Turkey ceded Batum to Soviet Georgia, in condition that Batum region would have autonomy. According to Article 3 of that agreement, the parties also agreed that the Nakhichevan region would have an autonomous status under the tutelage of Azerbaijan, provided that Azerbaijan would not see this tutelage to the third side. Adversely uh, dismissed Armenia. Russia was obliged to take steps toward the Transcaucasian Republics to that they would recognize the articles related to them in that agreement. The clauses of the Moscow Treaty concerning Soviet Armenia were similarly reaffirmed by the Kars Treaty of October 13, 13 1921. It was clear that uh, uh, it was clear from the political reality of that moment that despite the displeasure of the Armenian side, the change of borders was not possible in the coming years. But still the annexion of part of Western Armenia, I mean Kars and Surmalu, to Turkey and Nafijivan to Soviet Azerbaijan had an impact on the relations, at least psychologically. After the formation of the USSR, the relations between Soviet Armenia and Turkey became more regulated and at the same time uh, became more controlled by Moscow. Even the uh, state, trading uh, state uh, trading organization HIR, Armenian Trade of Soviet Armenia, has already opened its representative office in Kars. This was the only organization that officially communicated with the Republic of Turkey on behalf of Soviet Armenia. The remaining commercial and economic relations were regulated by the central authorities of the USSR. The higher organization also made full use of the opportunity given to it to take necessary steps for the economy of Soviet Armenia in trade relations with Turkey. The exchange of goods continued. Cotton, millet, barley, leather, and brandy were exported to the less developed regions of Western Turkey. It should be noted that since 1924, Turkey had planned a rather large customs for the Armenian goods, customs fee for Armenian goods, which was about 60% of the value of the goods. In other words, Turkey tried to develop their eastern regions at the expense of the Transcaucasia, but at the same time, they did not allow to development of Soviet Armenia. By the way, Georgia greatly benefited from this. In a very short period of time, it gained a dominant position in the Turkish Transcaucasian economic relations. In order to imagine the proportion of trade and economic relations between Soviet Armenia and Turkey, let us, uh, let us uh, uh, take, uh, take a look at the turnover of goods through the Lindenkan, Alexander Old Customs Office in 1924-1925. 317 tons of goods were exported from Armenia to Turkey, whereas 
5,065 tons of goods were imported from Turkey to Armenia. 1,343 tons of goods were imported to Armenia through our Mark Farad Customs Office, and 210 tons of goods were exported. Moreover, part of goods exported from Armenia's customs to Turkey were Azerbaijani goods, oil. Armenia just played a transit role. These numbers show that after the declaration of the Republic of Turkey, all for trade and economic relations between Transportation and Turkey, which were already part of the USSR, were developing. Turkey did everything possible to import less goods from Soviet Armenia. By the way, uh, the biased trade and economic relations conducted by Turkish authorities with Soviet Armenia gave more interest to smuggling. Turkish traders started smuggling goods from Armenia to Turkey. Summarizing this section, we should note that the government of Soviet Armenia and the central authorities of the USSR were inclined to the development of economic uh, relations between Turkey and Soviet Armenia, which was in the, in the interest of both. However, at the same time, in the context of trade relations with Transcaucasia in general, Turkey, despite geographically and uh, the presence of, uh, of direct railway uh, connection, tried not to give priority to Armenia in these relations, instead preferring Georgia and Azerbaijan. Another factor, the Turkish, uh, the, the Kurdish Zorda movement that began in the second half of the 1950s had a certain impact on the relations between the Republic of Turkey and Soviet Armenia in terms of security. In February 1925, a strong Kurdish rebellion broke out in the eastern region of Turkey under the leadership of Sheikh uh, Saif. It is beyond to sco uh, scope of our report to address the details of the of the uh, that uh, present. Amy does it better than me. Let us to uh, just uh, present how it affected uh, the Soviet-Turkish relations, the focus of which was also Soviet-Armenia. The Turkish state propaganda machine began to speed reports that the uh, instigators of the uprising were foreign countries, primarily referring to the British. During the rebellion, the Turkish government constantly worked to uh, instill on the Kurdish sentiments in the leaders of Soviet Union, presenting the Kurdish movement as pro-imperialist, pro-Western, and agent. The Turks believed that after the failure of the United Armenia plan, the British uh, would tried to create an independent large Kurdistan in order to control the oil of Mosul and protect India. It is hard to believe that Moscow did not guess Ankara's so-called anti-imperialist propaganda strategy. However, it is obvious that the Soviet authorities, guided by strict pragmatic uh, calculations, not only accepted them, that also paid tribute to Turkish journalist aspirations in the Kurdish issue. The rebellion of Sheikh Said was followed by the rebellion of Ararat. The Turkish authorities started to work more energetically with the Soviet authorities. It is fact that the uh, Kurdish political party was behind the Ararat uprising, whose foundation and activity had a direct connection, connection with the Armenian Revolutionary Party Dashan Sitium. Many Armenians who still uh, remained in Western Armenia supported the Kurdish 
öyle. Olduğu için gave the Turkish leadership grounds, so called grounds, to provoke the Soviet authorities. The Soviet central authorities, again based on their pragmatic calculations, not only reacted negatively to the Kurdish rebellion, but also did everything to prevent its traces in Soviet Armenia. There were not few cases when Kurdish rebels crossed the Soviet-Turkish border. The Soviet authorities were especially focused on Soviet Armenia from this point of view. Uh, and the borders sometimes also affected trade and economic relations. They closed border borders. The underground Dashnak uh, Sekhan organizations of Soviet Armenia were subjected to more severe persecution on suspicion of supporting the Kurdish rebels. Moreover, there was even a, an attempt to connect the transportation and the Bolshevik rebellion in 1930s with Kurdish infiltrators. That appeasing uh, caused by grave uh, uh, grievance against, uh, against collectivization in Soviet Union, which also took place in Soviet Armenia. In general, also, the situation was uh, controllable from the point of view of preventing the possible infiltration of the Kurdish rebellion into Soviet Armenia. It created a necessary tension, the lack of which was not felt in the Bolshevik dictatorial regime. Basically, uh, these were the Questions related to the relations between the Republic of Turkey and Soviet Armenia in 1930s. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, our final last speaker is Jan uh, Stein. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Montana and her master's and PhD from Princeton University. Her book, The Margins of Empire, Kurdish Militias in the Ottoman Tribal Zone, was published by Stanford University Press in 2011 and translated into Turkish in 2013. Dr. Klein has also authored numerous articles and book chapters on various topics related to late Ottoman and Kurdish history and is currently working on the construction of minorities in the late Ottoman Empire and post Ottoman states. Uh, Dr. And the process of minoritization for the Kurds was closely linked to that which Armenians experienced. And I think we miss a lot when we fail to recognize minorityhood as a historical process rather than as a given. It's unfortunate that many Ottomanists, despite wonderful contributions to the field, continue to treat the concept of minorities ahistorically as they refer to those groups who were either non-dominant in terms of religion and sometimes ethnicity, uh, or numerically inferior as minorities. The groups considered as minorities in this literature are mostly non-Muslims who were identified at some point in the Ottoman Minet system, although ethno-linguistic groups sometimes find themselves featured in these works as well. But it's important here to recognize Bayer's reminder that the Millet order was not a minority protection system in the modern sense, but an organizational structure for dealing with non-Muslim diversity within a plural society. Thus, to picture Ottoman society along the lines of a Muslim versus non-Muslim or majority-minority dichotomy is too simplistic and in fact is loaded with political agendas which are a byproduct of later developments in the 19th and 20th centuries. Yanandra Pandey points out that minorities are not automatically minorities and that minorities like communities are historically constructed. We commonly use the term minority to de describe groups that are distinguished by common ties of descent, physical appearance, language, culture or religion, in virtue of which they feel or are regarded as different from the majority of the population in the society. 
But this concept of minorityhood is a product of the mid-19th century. It only referred to religious groups at the time, although it did evolve to identify numerically inferior or non-dominant national or ethnic groups. But it wasn't until after the First World War that minority became an active term in international law as part of the peace settlement. By this time, the nationality principle, the idea that a people should have its own state, was not just a political ideal, but was becoming enshrined in international law. The question now surrounded what to do with those groups who were not the majority associated with the new states as the maps changed. Should minorities be moved across borders? Should they have rights within the new states that now incorporated them as minorities? As Weitz points out, forced deportations and minority protections were and are two sides of the same coin. An entirely new way of conceiving of politics focused on discrete populations and the ideal of national homogeneity under the state. So Kurds did not truly become minorities until the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and their incorporation into post-Ottoman states and, of course, modern Iran. But from that point forward, Kurdish identity became, in Turkey most notably, the most sociologically significant minority identity, as Abdunun has suggested. Before that happened, though, there was a subtle process through which, without official designation or recognition as a minority, Kurds underwent a process of minoritization in the late Ottoman period. As I've argued elsewhere, the minoritization of the Kurds was closely connected to the minoritization of Armenians, which came first. Both Kurds and Armenians experienced, along with their other Ottoman compatriots, the same kinds of shifts towards modern statecraft and the transition to governments defined as national and based on citizenship, ideals of representative government, and new ideas about territoriality, as did others around the world. These concepts and practices were important, no matter how imperfectly they were applied, because at least theoretically, these changes meant that states and their citizens had to decide whom the states represented, especially in a period when border bands were being demarcated with more concrete borders. The communities within and across new borders came to be viewed from the perspective of the central, Ottoman, central government and eventually the titular group, in terms of their loyalty to the state or national ideal or the level of threat they pose to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the, of the state. So there's a significant connection between minoritization and threats or realities of foreign intervention. In the Ottoman context, I suggest that the Armenians became the minority extraordinaire against the backdrop of this association. As Eric Weitz also points out, Article 61 of the Berlin Treaty of 1878, which followed the Russo-Ottoman War, made their protection a constituent element of the international system, not the cause of an individual state. And here he's speaking of Jews and Armenians together. Reforms in what were now designated as the six Armenian provinces were imposed on the Ottomans, which Europeans would oversee. With this and later reform packages of 1895, and 18, 1914, the Armenian, Armenian community was now viewed as suspect and as a menace to Ottoman sovereignty and territorial integrity, as Eastern Anatolia now became known as the Armenian provinces to the great powers. Various ingredients went into the minoritization of Armenians and later Kurds, such as the Young Turks' demographic engineering policies, nationalist educational, cultural, and even economic policies, and of course, they do remain important to the understanding of the minoritization process. But today, I'd just like to focus more explicitly on um, connecting new concepts of territoriality to the making of minorities and the violence that ensued. Ultimately, boundaries and borders are, not, uh, are, are tied not just to geographical space, but to the demographic character of that space, be it real, imagined, or projected. As Pandey argues that majorities and minorities became unmarked and marked citizens, I'd like to highlight how this process resulted in marked and unmarked notions of territoriality as well, sometimes in actual boundary markers, but in the case of minorities, not officially delineated, but often euphemistically understood as marked spaces. 
The Ottoman re uh, Empire had plenty of regions that drew their names from the peoples who lived there. But these regions were delimited with boundaries on a map. They were vague and fuzzy. Um, they often overlapped with others, as in the case of Armenia and Kurdistan. And it wasn't until the late 19th century that these regions and their very aims became politicized as new concepts of territoriality and sovereignty came into play. The process through which Ottoman Armenians became minoritized began around 1878 with those reform programs and treaties that followed the Russo-Ottoman War, and even earlier. Recalling the importance of foreign intervention in creating or crystallizing majorities and minorities, we can locate the provisions of these post-war treaties in this context. As the empire's six eastern provinces were now called the Armenian provinces by Europeans, Armenians were viewed with fresh suspicion as traitors whose loyalty was in doubt. They were seen as agents who would assist foreigners in further dismantling the empire. This led to a rise in repression and violence against Armenians who responded by expanding their own demands for foreign intervention and protection as they needed it. The great powers were happy to oblige. Armenians had gone from being the most loyal millet to a group that increasingly represented a threat to the territorial integrity of the empire. Designating six provinces as Armenian provinces which could be mapped was a key step in this process. Armenians thus began the process of minoritization on many levels, in the eyes of European powers, in layers of Ottoman government, in the eyes of other Ottoman groups, and of their own volition, uh, lest we are tempted to deny their own agency in the process. <coughs> Excuse me. It's important to remember that just as minorities are constructed, so are majorities. While Kurdish intellectuals began working through the process of what Kurdishness meant in the Ottoman context, and to what extent Kurdistan should have some special designation in the post khazimat era, it was really through the violence of the First World War and the uncertainty surrounding what would happen to the remainder of the empire that the process of Kurdish minoritization took place. And this is evident in the flurry of political and journalistic activity that took place in the armistice period. Kurds and other Ottoman groups worked to extract meaning from the rather vague language of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, especially the 12th point, which concerned the sovereignty of what was left of the empire and its diverse peoples. Some Kurds made it clear that they really would not like to be a minority in a state that denied them equality, for as they had perceived over the previous decade, early features of their mi minoritization process had begun to make themselves evident the central Ottoman government viewing Kurds as an uncivilized uh, group, as a wild card in the borderlands, and especially dangerous as a cross-border people. But the war changed the facts on the ground significantly. The vast majority of their Armenian neighbors had been eliminated through genocide. The borders of the empire, let alone its continued existence, were unclear. Amidst this chaos, Kurds hedged their bets they published numerous articles in the post-war press referencing Wilson's 14 points and making arguments for the Kurdishness of Kurdistan, as they were wary of being incorporated into a possible independent Armenia in eastern Anatolia, and also concerned that the Kurdishness of Kurdistan was being erased by the Turks. In order to demonstrate that Kurds deserved separation and were a majority in their own region, and to resist becoming minoritized in a larger than unclear Turkish or Armenian or Ottoman entity, they worked to counter denialist claims in a number of ways. They used Orientalist research to assert Kurdishness as unique from Turkishness. One writer criticized the policies of Ottoman official Suleyman Nazif for the evil policy which evidently aims at Turkifying Kurds and makes the life of an innocent nation a plaything. While some writers linked themselves racially to Armenians in order to highlight their non-Turkishness, others began to separate themselves from Armenians in order to justify their claims to Kurdistan, especially as an Ar independent Armenia was still on the table. One writer denounced those who referred to Kurdistan by, quote, such strange names as the eastern provinces, the eastern regions, eastern Anatolia, the frontier, and even Armenia without calling it by its real name. 
Interestingly, Kurds continued to adopt the same language that was being used to minoritize and erase Armenians in order to establish themselves as a majority in Eastern Anatolia at the same time as they rejected this language. So marking or delimiting a territory as national didn't just result in maps that identified one nation state's boundaries vis-a-vis -vis another's, but represented something aspirational as well. David Sack points out that a given delimited area is not territory in and of itself, it only becomes so when its boundaries are used to affect behavior by controlling access. Not only did access into and out of the national boundary thus come to be regulated, but access to the majority identity and full citizenship of the country came to be constrained as well. In this sense, the identity of the territory uh, marked was also aspirational. As Pende has shown for his study of South Asia, the question that came to be asked was, whose country is this anyway? It wasn't just the numerical proportion of a particular community vis-a-vis -vis the dominant or titular community that made it a minority, but rather the extent to which this group was imagined to be a threat to the whole, or more specifically, to the sovereignty of the dominant or titular group and to the territorial integrity of the state. The burden of which fell on the minorities in the making, especially Armenians in the late Ottoman period and Kurds after the empire was torn apart. After all, as Hadley also Wright points out, the test of loyalty is in fact required for those who are not real or natural citizens, in other words, marked citizens. Muslim Turks were the group who became the we, the we who needed no articulation. And lastly, we can also consider here the concept of marked and unmarked territoriality. Marked territory, such as Armenia or Kurdistan, needed to be erased. Kurds responded to the beginning of the erasure of their identity through the erasure of their region, Kurdistan, in their journals already in the late Ottoman period. And I've only cited a teeny little bit of color for you there, for the interest of time. What little of the empire remained was becoming Turkish, not through uh, just a demographic shift, shift, but through a conceptual shift. By the post-Ottoman period, Turkish territory in Turkey became unmarked, taken for granted. All of Turkey was supposed to be comprised of Turks, aside from the non-Muslims who had now officially become minorities. The East became the euphemism for Kurdistan, and whatever was not the East was unmarked. This while at the same time erasing Kurdish identity. Kurds became both marked and erased citizens. They were populous. Their very existence as non-Turks threatened the Turkish identity of the new country, and their continued ties to kin across new borders threatened the territorial integrity of the state. Kurds became the new minority extraordinaire in an implicitly marked and securitized territory. All right, everyone. So we do have uh, some time for questions. Uh, so we'll try to take as many as possible. Uh, let's start. Uh, yes, Dr. Marsupia. Uh, yes, I was. Uh, thank you all for some very interesting papers. I, I have a question for the last presentation, and it, it, it, it, uh, it it's an area that I, I don't particularly have any knowledge in, but uh, with regard to the role of the census in the Ottoman Empire, what was the role of the census in this concept of minoritization? Because we know that the, the first census uh, in the Ottoman Empire was 1831, um, after the Janissary Rebellion that was put down with a suspicious event. Passing over roads that were death marches. And, and you know, my um, grandmother was from Eintracht, uh, so they, they, they every Sunday would be there. And they don't realize, you know, so I said, you constantly explain to people what was going on here, if there was some way to present my family. Yeah, um, I really appreciate that because I, I'm actually working starting to work on um, settler colonial 
you know, exploring this as a case of Southern Philippines. Mm -hmm. But um, when I'm talking about territorial integrity, this is, of course, from the perspective of the state. And so, um, and this process of minoritization, it's a process. The state is I have a question. I have one. Here. People will not be doing that. Uh, and this pertains, I think, to the uh, to both of your presentations, sort of, because it relates to the RF rebellion. Uh, so, uh, in you know, perhaps you can address the uh, the discourse on the Kurdish and Turkish side, and, and you can address the one on the Armenian side. So, this question of why is this. Uh, Arab rebellion less emphasized. I believe pretty much also in the Armenian context, as it is in the in the Turkish one. Uh, so they had to grab and word of mouth or travelers like the Forbes. Um, but you know, beyond the lack of, and again, maybe in the Armenian context there are there are more sources. But um, I think beyond that, you know, the fact that you. Um, I do think you know, and maybe I'm being provocative, but I do think there's been. A, Possibly a greater attention to racist memory. I, I don't know. I really would like to hear what other people have to say, but I think compared to Sheikh Saeed or Jefsim or Idlis, um, it's, I don't know, I don't have another explanation, but I think we should hear it. It has been greatly explored in, in the published uh, archives of the general stuff in Turkey. Mm -hmm. the, the, the, the, like um, general stuff archives. So uh, there are a bunch of volumes on uh, the Sheikh effects, like uh, the whole rebellions during the early Republican period, so from the entirely the state perspective, for sure. The sources you can find also in both the archives. Yeah, in the Arab archives. So what's interesting, this isn't directly answer your question, I can't give the experts, but um, one thing that I was participating in a workshop at, at, at Yale um, in May on um, World War One in the Middle East, and I was tasked with, you know, things, some sources that would help us understand what was going on with the Kurds. And one question that came up um, was, so the armistice period, we often think it and it's just a few years, of course, after the war, that this is just a few years. But in fact, we can see, if we see um, these ongoing movements, including the Sheikh Saeed Rebellion, including Ararat, including Darsin, um, then that period is much longer than is often acknowledged in the literature, that, ar that so-called armistice period. So even though there isn't, this is an interesting time period, because even though there isn't much scholarship on this right now, you know, there's just a few people, you know, who have written on this, uh, you know, there's a number of publications in the process uh, about this. So I'm, I believe that in, within the next year or two, uh, right, the conversation about this is going to be very different. Suddenly there's this increased interest. Uh, in the Arab archives alone, there's hundreds of documents related to specifically the different negotiations, agreements, Agreements that are not really being met, you know, so there's these, uh, for example, these letters that go back and forth about $5,000 that the ARF is supposed to send the Kurds that never arrives, and it's like they keep writing back. And so so there's, uh, there's a lot of material that actually is not explored. Part of it is actually used by uh, uh, Amy in her work, and I think Ulugan's forthcoming yeah. work is also going to be important in that. All right, any further questions? All right, thank you everyone for being here and joining me. Thank you. Thank you.